My mother had a miscarriage. What she didn't know was that she had twins. I was that other twin, still inside her womb. Now there was no ultrasound in those days, and she continued to have bleeding and discomfort. So her doctor used ringed forceps to remove her ineffective IUD. Then he used the forceps to reach in, grasp, and remove any loose material he could from her womb. Last, he gave her five days of the drug methogen. Methogen causes the uterus to expel remaining birth tissues to minimize bleeding and risk of infection. But her stomach kept growing and several doctors didn't believe it was a normal pregnancy. So mom wanted whatever it was surgically removed. Fortunately for me, her OB doctor urged her to wait. I guess you could say I survived a miscarriage and an abortion. Each year in the United States, about two million women lose a pregnancy through spontaneous or elective abortion. That's one third of all pregnancies. These people often suffer silently for years. So I asked women and men to share their journeys through the darkness of infant loss. And I found the potential for understanding and support is brighter than ever. I was almost 40, so we really had to get moving. The doctor had said that I still had one good year, so that put a little pressure on the whole thing. <laughs> My thinking is, don't worry, there's gonna be a second chance. We're gonna have other, other, other time to do it. And, you know, we try to fix everything, and the plan is gonna be perfect like we planned it. We got pregnant right away, and um, we we're so uh, encouraged by that because a lot of couples at that our age, what the problem that we're having is that they cannot get pregnant. But when the days were passing and I started having some symptoms and the doctor tried to manage it with some medications, but things were not working right. I, I knew, the doctor said, now we have to say that the three miscarriages are related to each other. And um, since you're over 40, now you're also in a different category. But I said, I cannot do this anymore. I, I am done and I need help. And we thought everything was on schedule, a uh, piece of cake. Mm. I foolishly broadcasted to everyone <laughs> <laughs> but in part because my job requires that I take special precautions when I'm pregnant and so it was very difficult to keep that secret. Somewhere between uh, 10 and 12 weeks, um, the baby stopped developing. I went to the doctor and found out that I had high blood pressure and because of the high blood pressure I had to be admitted into the emergency room and I was only about five months pregnant at that point. And so that morning they told me that I would be on bed rest until the baby came, but that they would prolong the pregnancy as long as they could. And that was like eight in the morning. And then by 2.30, they said, we're taking you in for emergency C-section. So our daughter was born, Shreya, was born um, that evening. She was only one pound, four ounces. She got sick, she got an infection and um, was sick for three days and then she passed away. I, I left that morning and I guess I, the idea of we're going to lose this baby was not something that I thought of. Uh, the doctor said, you know, it's something that probably just stay in bed, rest, and you'll be fine. So well-meaning, you know, ladies from the church came and made this tea out of pecan shells uh, and had me drink it to see if that would stop the bleeding. And uh, I'll never forget that, it was horrible. <laughs> it's so, uh, then by, you know, by about six o'clock or so, Saturday around sundown, 
uh, I start feeling really sick and you know nauseous and like I'm gonna pass out and contractions and the whole nine yards and uh, I, I lose the baby in the bathroom. We waited a while and then we were um, trying again and so last year in August found out that I was pregnant and we're um, it was bittersweet but we were very excited at, at eight weeks the the tech that was doing the ultrasound she was just asking questions and I said is there a heartbeat and she said no I don't think so so that's um, how we found out about her second loss and we found out later that it was a boy I think maybe it was a little bit harder because it was the second loss and it was so unexpected you kind of feel like lightning doesn't strike twice and I, I always think that as that is worse than, than the pain of childbirth for some reason. It was like this feeling like something had to come out, you know, in order to feel better. But at the same time, I didn't want it to happen. He was um, not in this depression like me. So he would say, well, well let's have another baby. Let's try another time. And, um, but it was not that simple because I could not go through this pain again. By the time you've had three miscarriages, especially three in a row, then you're up to a 50% chance that you're going to have another miscarriage with a future pregnancy, and sometimes even higher depending on what the underlying cause is. Sometimes you've had a previous ultrasound that shows a clear heart beating, and then you have a follow-up visit two or three weeks later, and then unfortunately there's no heartbeat. Well, I had a patient today who unfortunately um, has now gone through her third miscarriage. Each time she gets pregnant, she's excited and she comes in for her examinations. Feeling better? Lots better. Good. Thank you. Good, good. <laughs> I saw your ultrasound results. They look really good. I know she already talked to you about it yeah, when, when you had that done last week. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, that's fantastic news. Yes, and initially, uh, with this pregnancy, things went very well for her. Um, she had a heartbeat at about six weeks gestation a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so she had some hope and encouragement despite her previous history. Um, but unfortunately, when she came in today for her examination, our midwives were looking at her and found out that uh, there wasn't a heartbeat, and I came in and looked and confirmed. These patients, um, again, they're devastated. They want to know why. They blame themselves sometimes, um, and, and they want answers. And so we try and help them out and do a workup and get them in to see a specialist. I didn't want that because I would always prefer to think that it's my fault because it is so painful. I don't want Claudia to even have to think that it might be his fault. The, the simple unfortunate fact that most of the time we just don't know what caused it. There's so many multiple factors, but in general the most common cause is a chromosomal defect or of some type. For example, a Down syndrome sometimes will result in an early miscarriage or an extra chromosome somewhere else or a missing chromosome. In the block before our block that where we turned every morning, there were protesters outside with signs against abortion. I realized that was an abortion clinic. It's a baby, it's not a period. It's a baby. I've heard of abortion clinics before and I've heard of protesters, but I have never like seen that what's going on. She will feel regret. She will feel pain. She will always be a mother. Something started happening in my heart and I was a little angry about it. Like, I cannot believe they're giving up their babies when I long so much for a baby. I went in and they held me down because I was crying so hard and the only thing the nurse said to me was, don't, don't scratch me with your nails because I had really long nails. She said, don't scratch me with your nails. You can hold my hand, but don't scratch me with your nails. And so I was laying there trying not to scratch her with my nails and you know, hearing the vacuum machine going on and um, then all of a sudden I heard the noise of the baby going in the tube and I knew it was over. And they took me back to what's called a recovery room where it's just a big room of bean bags and you sit in a bean bag chair and they put a heating pad on your stomach and give you crackers. I was just crying uncontrollably. I could not quit crying. And no one else in the room was crying. There's probably 40 other girls in there. And the counselor came over to me and she said, what kind of life would your baby have had? You're only 17. I went home that night. My parents didn't have a clue what had happened. I ate dinner with them. And I went to bed and went to school the next day and nobody knew. And the first abortion was um, with a dancer. Uh, it wasn't six months later where all of that came apart. And then I started 
dating some other people, and then there was, um, there was a hairdresser. And, uh, you know, I, I know that was mine, and I took her uh, in, and um, it was one of those things where, oh, all right, you know, I'm doing everything else wrong, and this is the only thing that's legal in my life. At that time, I never thought twice about my decision to have an abortion. It was very common, it was understood, and that's what people did. You know, I was, I was in school, I had, I had plans, and so did my, at the time, boyfriends. I had a full-blown acknowledgement that I, I had taken the life of my baby. I had to acknowledge that I had a baby. We had a baby. I saw myself as though I was on a roller coaster that no one had any control to turn off. So when I had this third abortion, I thought, no one can turn off this roller coaster, I'm gonna jump. And I had my tubes tied at 25. And I remember the doctor sitting with me, trying to talk me out of it. And he said, you're gonna meet someone you're gonna fall in love with and you're gonna to wanna to have children. I was trying to pray for them and find compassion in my heart, but it wasn't until one day, God put somebody in my path, a close friend, she opened up her heart. <clears throat> She shared her journey with me, and I could not believe our worlds collide, and it changed the whole view, the perspective I had. Recently, we were looking to, for a guest speaker to have um, at one of our events at the memorial, and someone suggested we have someone represent um, miscarriage, the miscarriage side of our ministry, and because most people just know about the abortion side. And so I reached out to someone who had recently placed a paver in our garden. And his first question was, well, what does miscarriage have to do with abortion? And I, you know, I kind of stopped. I didn't know what to say. It kind of threw me off because no one's ever asked that before. And, um, you know, I just told him that we've both lost a child. While I've never had a miscarriage, you know, I'm still really hurting from, you know, what I went through. And I just, I felt like with him, he only saw my, it was still my choice. You know, I still walked in there, whether I wanted to or not, I did. You know, and he and his wife, they didn't, they didn't get to, to pick. It just happened. I was at um, the American College of OBGYN um, national meeting, and there was picketers there picketing against OBGYN to perform abortions. And the way they present it, that, um, you know, they have signs up saying baby killers and um, very hateful messages. Um, the interesting thing is, though, most OBGYNs don't perform elective abortions. Um, there's very few that do. And um, for example, I don't perform abortions um, electively. Um, some of the confusion comes up because in the medical terminology, abortion can mean an elective abortion where a patient decides to terminate their own pregnancy um, for their own reasons. But most often, it's somebody who's had a miscarriage. There's an embryonic demise. There's no heartbeat. And so they have um, either a spontaneous abortion that happens at home or in an office or medical setting, or sometimes a surgical procedure like a, like a dilation and curatage, we're aborting the contents of the intrauterine cavity. You know, when I hear someone say elective abortion, um, really it's not at all what it is, especially in my case, but so many others of the women, you know, women and men that I talked to, I really felt like I had no choice. You know, it was like, you know, finish high school my life and then uh, you know, what he wanted me to do and no one knew and I felt like I was backed in a corner and I had no way out. I had a, a very confidential conversation with a, a young lady who had had an abortion and it was not something that was her choice, it was something that she was pressured into and, and, and she, she, she was feeling the exact same loss that I was feeling. It was pretty hot back in, in those days in 71. We had lost two aviators, and um, so that's why we got sent. And they were sending the crazy people over. It was three or four o'clock in the morning, and, and the colonel came in and said, Dane, I, uh, we, got a, we got a mission, we got to fly. I said, where? I mean, we can't even see outside the tent. Well, let's, let's go do a weather check. I took him out, and I mean, we couldn't see anything. I, I was hard to even hover, and uh, so I, he said, yeah, okay. And then it was two hours later, about 6.30 in the morning, and they said, you know, 
head on out there, crank up the Hueys. We just had a, we had a, a mishap. He had sent out two Hueys uh, in that weather uh, with um, eight to 10 packs on board and uh, they flew together. Everybody was killed, so there was 14 people per bird. 28 people were dead, and the guys I was drinking with and playing cards with. I learned how to bury my emotions and take things. You know, when, when those guys got killed, nobody sent me out to say, oh, well, let us take care of your brain from what you just went through. No. It's like, you know, you got more to do today. And that being the case, you know, something happens. You dig a hole, you throw it in that hole, you cover it up, that's done. If not, that's all right. You come back, throw more dirt on it, cover it up a little deeper. And I remember going through the um, internet and I came across um, like post-abortion syndrome. Everything that they were listing, I was like, Oh, 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 I have, I have that, that, that. I mean, the majority of the things it was, it was um, listing. And I said, I have this. And I think that was a couple of years ago. And I still never really did anything about it. I just let it go and I just pushed it away. And I do believe there is something called post-abortion syndrome that happens to patients. I see it. I see patients that come into my office. They've had a pregnancy loss or they're, they're, experiencing the news that they're losing their pregnancy as we're talking. Um, and you see the immediate concerns and, and problems that they deal with emotionally, but then you see them back sometimes six months later, a year later, and they're still dealing with it. So I think it's real. Is it um, an officially recognized diagnosis in medical lit literature? I don't know if that's the case, but there is something, whatever you want to call it, that patients can experience long term. Of all the things that pop up is anger just rage. The, the triggers were so, you know, minuscule sometimes, but and somebody tapped that string that was tied to the box. And you know, I'm an engineer. I, that was down. That was concreted. That had rebar in it. That was long. That was deep. And, uh, but things would just fly out. Your emotions can really cloud, cloud things, even when you know something to be true. There was anger and yes, I'm angry and it's okay to be angry, and then there was the other part that was almost like shame. I did feel ashamed because I was angry at God. You know, I, I honestly did, because I felt like as if I should know better. You know, it's been called a, a woman's issue for so long, and so has pregnancy, you know, from that point of view. And those are family issues, you know, we need to reframe those, because if men don't hear that it's a men's issue, then they will never be able to. The alcohol abuse, the drug abuse, all the abuse that goes along with this, the self-abuse, the pornography with guys, it's like, you don't have to go there. The feelings of desire and simultaneously feeling possibly unworthy were so intense that I would cry at the drop of a hat. It hurts and I feel intense pain and, and almost pressure. When she had the moments that she needed to just cry, you know, I understood it. And I remember we, we would be there and she'd be crying and apologize. And I would say to her, you know, in some ways I told, I remember one time I told her, I said, you know, I envy you. If I had to go to a fourth one, I don't think I could, I, I don't think I could do it. And at that point, I just felt that I fell in this black hole. I was then in denial, and I was saying, this is not happening to me. This is, I'm going to fix it next time, and there's going to be always a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance. I went from a period that I, I only worked and cried pretty much. So it was not pretty. The fixing things are Sometimes not a fixing, but a demolishing thing. My decision to have an abortion was very consistent with the rest of my lifestyle. It wasn't until many years later, at the age of 28, when I met my now husband, that I began to think about having a family. And um, when I found out I was pregnant with my son, it just all came out. Two weeks after my son Justin was born, he was lying in his crib. and. Um, 
it was like 2 a.m. or something. I just gave him his uh, bottle and laid him back down. And for whatever reason, I turned around and looked back at him and it was just like, it just hit me what I had done. And you know, I just started crying and I couldn't quit crying. I didn't stop crying for days. I loved my son because he was my son, but I didn't love him. Well, I felt guilty loving him and you know, how can I love him when I didn't love her? gut-wrenching even now so many years later. I have three children now who are almost 18 and 16 and 12 and this child would be early 30s. Um, so I think about that all the time. I have friends who are 30. I think what has lingered for me is the uh, curiosity of was it a boy or a girl? Mm -hmm. uh, what would yeah. he or she look like, would have looked like. Right. Uh, we compare Jay, you know, our kids now, Jay and Brian. All those things continue to be present today. Mm -hmm. I think that the need that's there for support for women that have experienced miscarriage is the same need that's there for support for women that have experienced abortion. When the grief is yours, there's no other grief or pain that deep or that wide, or that big. You lose your child, you're gonna have emotions. You're gonna, you know, there are times where you're gonna feel angry, you're gonna feel whatever else, and I think honestly that's okay because you've suffered this life changing, everything thrown out of whack. The irrational part would be to, to go through a miscarriage and not have anger, or pain, or sadness. But that's exactly what sometimes we, we try to impose. And then the person feels lost. I was thinking God is the only one that can convince her that we have to try again, that the counselor is going to tell her, no, yeah, go ahead. You have to be strong and avoid all emotions and you're going to have to try until you're going to get the baby. But that was not the case of Isabel because she was so firm and she was just, give me the hand to me and say, don't talk to me anymore. I don't want to deal, to talk about this anymore. And I was hopeless. I was broken hearted. I, when I see him playing with kids, and I see how his eyes light up, and how beautiful that interaction is, and I know what a great dad he would have been. It hurts so bad. I was feeling guilty, and I was crying out to God. And I said, well, maybe you want me to be humble, more humble than this? Do you want me to go under the carpet? And it, it, I, I didn't know what to do. There was this disconnect in that area. That was, we knew it was there, but we didn't want to talk about it because it hurt more. Sometimes the pain is so deep that uh, it is helpful to have a third person sort out and guide the conversation. If, uh, if the pain is too deep, Sometimes even the sharing becomes harmful because uh, they end up hurting each other rather than supporting each other. I said, God, just fix her so that she can come back, be my wife, and we can start dealing with our issues and work on ourselves. Right now, she's just working on these past issues involving other men. When men are our husbands, our lovers, our partners, are one of our biggest barriers because of their misconceptions of what we're doing when we go back to the past to heal from sexual relationships, abuse, and abortion with other men. Many times I felt inadequate. I felt like we might as well just get a divorce because I'm not the man that she needs and wants. If I spent too much, I got too nice of a bouquet. She didn't feel she deserved it and she wouldn't accept them. I had worked with this frustration that there was nothing I could do to please this woman. It didn't matter how much, how involved we were at the church, 
how much time I spent in prayer, how much time I spent reading the Word. It was all, I always seemed to fall short. And I know part of that was her, but at the same time, part of that was just me. We had both were looking at each other with the filters of the past because we had not completely dealt with everything, all the baggage that we brought to our marriage. And I promised myself I was not going to be uh, sucked into the vortex of anxiety and um, obsession over fertility. The anticipation of the efforts of conceiving a baby and then the disappointment of negative pregnancy test, you know, a couple weeks later just got to be so uh, discouraging for me. And um, how long did it go on? For well over two years. Yeah. I started getting more and more militant about timing and, you know, Paul is, is on a schedule that I can't control. Traveling quite a bit, yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah, militant is a good word. <laughs> and when you're both in the mood and it's a nice time and there's romance, then, you know, that's part of a natural relationship. But when there's a schedule and it's like, come on, let's go, it's, I'm ready. <laughs> then, I'm uh, ovulating. Then you're kind of running around like a hunted animal and sometimes you're like. <laughs> Lori and I had been married at least 13 years and I had not told her about my previous abortion experiences. I understood that I was covered by the blood. You know, Lord forgive me. And, uh, and I was. But I still had this tie to that box that was buried deep, deep, deep. And I just didn't understand it, but it was kind of like, yeah, you're done with all the rest of that, but you still have a little more paperwork to do. You were looking to have some men counselors to do abortion recovery. Lori had suggested that I take this Bible course so that I could teach it. When we had spent so much time on anger in that class, you know, that was an eye-opening experience. That's when we dug the box up. At the end of that course, which maybe 15 weeks or so, we all sat down in a little room, and I remember that room to this day. You know, I said, you know, you have someone right next to you who can teach this course and teach it from experience. Well, the first thing that went through my mind that he was okay and that he understood he was forgiven. I really wasn't angry. Um, I was shocked and when the shock wore off, or maybe before the shock wore off, I guess I, I wondered why he hadn't trusted me to tell me. Um, we'd been working in this together. Abortion recovery was an everyday word at the breakfast table. And we'd been married for a long time. I shared a lot of secrets with him, and I, I felt like he must not trust me. In my experience, the sooner I tell somebody something, the easier it is. If you're dating someone and you tell them, and they blow up and say, I can't handle this, then you do find out something sooner than later that you needed to know. But I think that if you tell them and share it with them, this is someone so important to you, and you share them something from deep in your heart, and tell them it's coming from deep in your heart, then I think you can build something stronger than you could have imagined. One thing I would tell any man out there who thinks that uh, you're too good to sit in front of a counselor and uh, pour your guts out with your wife if you're having problems in your marriage, uh, you really need to you really need to, to back the truck up and recalculate because you're about to lose everything you have. I think if, if, it ha if it were to happen again, I would try to find more uh, strength to stay quiet, <laughs> to shut up and to listen. Uh, the, the need to talk and to fix, and that was a lot about taking care of my own needs, protecting her, even connecting to a sense of helplessness that uh, I didn't like. There are people who want to be encouraging, who say, oh, it happens so often, everybody goes through it, it's a very common thing, but the good news is you can get pregnant. I, I wish I had a dime for every time somebody said that to me during our difficulties. Other people think that, uh, well, you know, it's that Maybe you're too stressed out. Go to the beach one weekend, and you'll see you'll have a baby. And it's um... is it that simple, Claudio? <laughs> no. <laughs>
they knew and they said, oh, well, sometimes there's something wrong with the baby and that's, you know, you know, the body knows and, you know, that's why you lose it or you're, you're young, you'll have some more. Like, no big deal. It, it didn't matter whether I was going to have some more or not. I had lost one. I had lost the one that I've been waiting for. It's like, oh, you guys are so smart. You don't know what you're... It's so hard to have kids nowadays, and oh, they're a lot of trouble, especially if they're teenagers. Oh, you're so smart. I wish I was in your shoes. A lot of people mistakenly think that being a parent starts when that child is born, and we mentally started preparing ourselves, mentally started doing all the things that parents do for when we found out that she was pregnant. And so I was a father who lost a son. He was eight weeks old. It's not something that you just all of a sudden just say, oh, it happens all the time. Oh, God allowed this for a reason. So what do I say to a family who just lost their child to miscarriage? What do I say? So people don't think that I'm going to be judgmental if they want to come tell me they've had an abortion. If you experience your loss through miscarriage and you're looking at someone else who has experienced it through abortion and you start to quantify it, then I think that's when you start looking at the route that they have taken and not look at the loss that they have experienced. Only someone who is willing to become vulnerable <laughs> is going to stay quiet, is going to sustain, is going to feel with you, rather than, oh, that's too vulnerable for me to be there, so let me just give you a, a quick response or a padded answer. We had a lot of family um, relatives coming from out of town, and my cousin that lives here in the area, he wanted to do a five course meal. He's a great cook. He doesn't let too many people in his kitchen when he's cooking. <laughs> hey, he's not getting away. Hey, what, what's he doing in the kitchen? He's not uh, hey. the but I promised him that I would be a good um, assistant cook. That's why they call it limoncello. Limoncello. That's where the limoncello comes from. Yeah. It is. I'm thankful for him and his wife because when we had our third miscarriage, as soon as they heard, they came running and they came just to hug us. They didn't say anything, they just hugged us. And to me, that was very important. You remember Julia Childs? Hello, Miss Amphalt. You remember that? And this is the secret ingredient. See, this is why I don't allow anybody in. Oh, so, let me see what it is. No, means. you missed it. <laughs> that was kind of like the first event outside that I found myself laughing in. And frankly, you know, you know, this needs a little bit of more oil. I mean, it is, it is, it is, it is a pesto. You know, olive oil is good for you to take a bath in. Yes. You know that? It would be much prettier if we did. You know where Par Parma? Parmigiano. Parma Reggiano. People don't know that Parmesan cheese comes from Parma, yeah. a real city. Are you the chef or the sous chef today? I'm the sous chef, but... Oh, really? You're pretending to be the chef sometimes. I think you took over my kitchen. I'm sorry. Any, anything that comes from a can should stay in a can. Yeah. That's my philosophy. Is that your philosophy? I'm going to make it my philosophy. Yeah, I would. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. It was like the beginning of like, yeah, I can go back and, and have a normal life. <laughs> I would be astounded as a church member to, to hear a pastor do would be to acknowledge, to start with acknowledging that this is part of what happens in the congregations and that that is part of what happens in humanity. You will be there and maybe someone else who had the miracle that you didn't have, they're there right beside you and they're, they're being celebrated and it's as if your loss didn't even happen. Well, if I acknowledge this loss and I'm acknowledging that, yeah, it was a child and there are people in the church who don't want to acknowledge that. Maybe the pastor is gonna come, it's gonna give you some verses and 
read those verses and go home and you'll see God is going to provide. God knows what's the best, but that's not enough. We have a Father's Day celebration for the dads who have their kids and are running around and are healthy and fine. And then the dads who don't have their kids, they're just in the background. They were, they were saying, oh, do you have kids? No, um, I don't have kids. And, you know, they saw me as a half package. You know, the whole package was not there. There is this almost bubble of silence that you exist in. That same church family that just had that massive outpouring of love and grace and mercy for the uh, unforeseen tragedy of someone dying in an automobile accident somehow loses their capacity to love and forgive and embrace and support and care for and nurture um, someone who made a horrible, horrible decision by way of an abortion or someone uh, who's lost a child because of miscarriage, just simply because of the awkwardness. Because we don't have a person present, we don't have a funeral usually, depending on the stage of pregnancy, and people are at a loss, so they gloss it over. And people in the churches say, we don't have that problem here. Well, that's because you don't talk about it here. One of the things that we would have appreciated would have been to have an opportunity to to have a, a small service or a ceremony where where you know people would come and we would be able to at least tell the story again and and then have a a sense of community you know and and just have people share the grief together. I don't think the the initial response um, in a miscarriage is that you want to go out and, and publicly have this massive show of support. But I think it, it could be very affirming if there was like a, I almost picture like the baby's room at the church, where there's a small gathering of maybe 10 or 12 or 14 church members that have all experienced miscarriages and have a prayer service, just a small intimate group. You'll never forget, but it, it would make it easier to have a place to talk about it. People getting up and, and discussing openly what their struggles are and being able to educate the church and give a glimpse into what their troubles are and just invite the church to just listen and just be supportive, not judgmental, just hear what someone else is going through and try to imagine how you might be accepting and comforting to that person. If you just had a, uh, a designated uh, person within the church that you could call if you're having um, pregnancy-related issues or miscarriages or anything, um, you'd have a pool of people that could uh, minister to that. How are you doing? And I know what he was asking about, but I pretend, oh, I'm doing fine, thank you. How about you guys, how are you? And he goes, no, 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 no. How are you doing? So he opened up and he said that he and his wife had a miscarriage. I think before they had their girls. He explained how hard it was for them and how God helped them in the grieving process. And my eyes kept just getting bigger and bigger every time he said something because that's what I was feeling and nobody had, um, especially because I had not reached out to anybody. Nobody had shared that level of, of their experience with me. But the most important thing he told me was that he knows that his baby is going to be in heaven. And Dad gave me that hope that I was going to hold my babies. And I've been a Christian all my life, and I've always sang about walking the streets of gold and being in heaven and seeing Jesus. But it had never been real before. Now, for the first time, I wanted to go to heaven. That was like the most important thing in my life, that moment on. You would think that if, if you went in and said, oh, this is a 
church that respects life. You know, if you've had an abortion, you're so welcome there. It just doesn't sell right now. There's a human being that is hurting mm -hmm. after that decision. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a place in the church for such a uh, need? Absolutely. Absolutely. How we do that is going to make the difference. Mm -hmm. So I've often heard uh, women say, when I left the church, after they preached about how bad abortion was, people came up to me and said, can you believe anyone would do that? And of course, she said, oh no, I can't. Well, she'd had an abortion, but she wasn't going to admit it then. Now, the woman who spoke that to her wasn't necessarily a malevolent, mean person. She just didn't know that people regret abortion and what happens when they regret it. If there had been a balanced message of justice and mercy, then I think it would help other people know what to say, you know. I'm sorry for your pain, you know. How, I want to walk this with you. How can I? If we really are supposed to be the, the hospital for the broken, and we're really supposed to bind up their wounds and help them heal and, and teach them how to be whole again, how can we not be in front of it? How can we say it's too controversial? You know, since when was Jesus not controversial? God put people in our path to guide us and uh, make an emphasis of the importance of doing something to m put memories in, in place for us so we can put some closure in our grieving. Isabel came up with this idea that we have to plant three trees to remember the three miscarriages that we have had. So, but it was very interesting how we did this process because it was very healing and Claudio, like where to plant them and how to plant them and... Those trees were like babies for me and I really took care of those. We were thinking, which one is going to be the one that's going to flower first? And that, that's how we're going to order which one is the firstborn and the second and the third. And I was surprised that that made me feel involved in the healing process between Isabel and me. So when we saw the first bloom, it was just beautiful. It was such hope. For some reason, that gave me something to look forward every single time I came until I saw the second tree butt up and it gave me some hope and the sun was rising on the horizon for me. I turned on the radio and the second I turned the radio on, the lady said, are you struggling with an abortion in your past? <laughs> I dropped the dish and broke it. And I just turned around and listened because I knew that it was what God wanted me to hear right then. At the end of the six week Bible study, uh, we were asked to do memorial service for our babies. We had named our babies. Um, I named mine Grace Danielle. Danielle means God is my only judge. But when I came in and saw over 2,000 plaques on the wall, each honoring an aborted baby, I, it hit, I, I knew it. I knew it then I wasn't alone. It's hard to mark how many visitors we get each month, but there's always evidence that people were here by the emails and letters and phone calls. This place is used a lot, and I think it's used a lot more than we even know. I'm not over it just because I run the memorial. <laughs> I'll never be over it, you know. Maybe when I get to heaven and I get to hold her, I'll be over it. I don't feel the guilt and shame anymore. I, I really feel healed. I've, God has taken that from me 100%. But I miss her. I miss her. You know, on my bad days, or especially around the um, the anniversary, uh, you know, it's that's that. I think about her. I don't think about God. I can't believe I did that. No, I I think about her, and I could have an eight-year-old daughter right now, and you know, we could be talking about makeup and boys and painting our fingernails and toes and. Yolanda went through three separate 
um, healing processes, one for each abortion. And my attitude was exactly as she had described it. Um, this was didn't involve me, so I just wanted her to get fixed and get over it so life could, then we could try to work on our issues. God started working on me and softened my heart. And when she went through the third support group, support group God literally spoke to me and said, I'm healing her. You can be part of the healing or you can continue to be, you can be part of the problem. But she's going to come out of this healed. Are you going to be her partner or, she, or not? If she had not aborted those three children and you married her, they would be your children. So what would you do if they were your children? I said, well, Lord, I would adopt them as mine. I don't want other fathers saying, oh, they're my kid. No, I would want to adopt them so that they would be our children. And so at the memorial service, when she named her three children, I came up to the altar with her and spoke to the Lord and confessed that it was my loss. Just as surely as they were her loss, they didn't exist, so they were my loss too. When David stepped up beside me and whispered in my ear and said, they're our children, I turned to him and I was stunned. I heard God say something to me. He said, Yolanda, you asked me to give you a man who would stand beside you, and there he is. I kept my promise. Now keep yours and love him. And this was the first time that God, in my walk with the Lord, that God showed me how much he personally loved me by giving me this gift for my wife that she could accept and would have real meaning for her. Because I knew I was hard. I was hardened from all that I had experienced and some choices that were awful. And I almost saw my heart melt. It was soft, and that was the first time, I think that was the first time that I felt I could really love this husband of mine. I realized that this time was the time when I had my abortion 10 years ago, and I knew that was an anniversary date. When it dawned on me, I was like, oh, I could, I could do something now. I could have some kind of, you know, memorial service. The thought of planting a plant or a tree, you know, spoke to me, so when, you know, the thought of 10 years came up, I said, I think it's time to, it's time to put this at rest. <laughs> As your friend, I'm just so happy that, that you're, you have the courage and you're teaming up with, yes. with God to do this work, to heal. And you reached out to me when I was trying to come out of my dark days. And you were so sincere telling me your story. And you didn't know that in my heart I had been struggling by driving by the abortion clinic every day. It wasn't until I heard your story that God switched my heart. And then I started praying every morning for the girls when I saw them in. Because I knew that even if they're gonna make that choice, they're going to be feeling the pain I've been feeling right. because someday they're going to realize that they wanted to be a mother. You feel it very soon. A counselor, a wise counselor told me that it would be good for me to journal and to um, write a letter to the baby. I don't think that day, meaning the day of the abortion, will ever be forgotten. Driving to the clinic with your father, talking to the counselor who asked me, do you really want to do this? going into the room and being on the table, seeing you on the ultrasound in your little body and little heart. It was the most beautiful and the most horrible memory I have. I love you very much. You'll always be a part of me. I'll see you on that day when Jesus returns for us. I can't wait to see your face. I love you, Hadassah, your mommy. My challenge and my hope and my encouragement for you is maybe the reason you're struggling with this, and maybe the reason all of those people out there on the peripheral and maybe the traditional church setting who don't know how to help you deal with this, 
uh, are helping you struggle with it because of the fact that God wants to help you write the end of your story. And part of that process is you beginning to find a voice and a place for, for this ordeal and this cycle that you've been through. But one day, I heard the voice, I heard distinctly, and it says, you're going to have kids. And I said, I'm going to have kids? Yes, you're going to have kids. And I, I was like starting to kind of laugh inside uh, and saying, wow, at this point, after all these that plans that we had made and didn't work, and now uh, you're telling me, God, that I am going to have kids? This particular day, I was in my Sabbath school class, and I saw a girl come in, and God put it in my heart. She needed somebody to reach out to her. And, uh, but I kept saying, Lord, but <laughs> she's young. I mean, she's going to think that I'm crazy, you know? <laughs> I was, uh, maybe it's not me. Somebody else is going to reach out. But, you know, I, I had this um, intense, um, request in my heart to reach out and I did and I know it's been a blessing for her and for me. After a while I realized that Isabel was having a lot of kids coming to her so call it if you will I can call them kids because they're spiritual kids. to our home and they are starting to reach out for us as parents and I was so happy because I was going to be a dad for them and that was a miracle for me. We have felt that God has put in these young people in our hearts to give us that part that's missing in us and that it's missing in them. I never thought it was um, going to happen this way and that it's going to be so fast. It would have been nice to read a book about it or something. <laughs> you have to not only care for them emotionally but the time. And I've stayed on the phone sometimes almost all night and um, or very late and Claudio calls me where you are it's like oh, I'm sorry I cannot this is very delicate I cannot I have to stay here <laughs> there sometimes we have to spank them a lot and if their parents they didn't I have to do it now I understand what these people were telling me that we were so smart not having kids because it's hard work whenever I would worry that I wouldn't be able to have kids. I remember the time when I just decided I'm tired of dating, I'm tired of being the old maid, I'm tired of one wondering why I'm not married. And when I gave all that up and said, okay, I want to invest in my church, I want to invest in my, my nieces and nephews' lives, and when I let go of it and stopped stressing and obsessing about it, um, that's when the Lord brought me this one. <laughs> and you know what? Um, he's, he's a great husband, and he's a phenomenal dad. It's such a special thing to watch him with the kids. It's, it helps me know him and love him on a whole other level. Thank you. You're welcome. We had a girl fly in from England um, in May, and I met with her for probably four hours. And she ordered the plaque and it, it got there. She flew in and, you know, she put the plaque on the wall and, you know, we had a memorial service and, you know, she and I went to dinner afterwards and she's just kind of like, I still feel bad. I'm like, it's not a magic wall, you know. <laughs> she wasn't a believer and she asked me point blank if I felt like she could be healed without uh, Jesus Christ in her heart and I told her no because we're not wired to kill
kill our children. We're, we're just not that way. No one is. Jesus made us, made everybody, everyone who's here. And so when we mess up so bad that we kill our kids, only He can fix it. I had been training leaders. I had gotten healing myself for my abortions over a period of years. And one day, I heard the Lord say to me, you know, you're missing something. And I said, what could I possibly be missing? I've, I've, I've dealt with this. I've received your forgiveness. I've named my children. I've experienced healing. What, what could it be? What am I missing? And I heard the Lord say to me, Yolanda, you are still aborting. You compare me with other people who, if they gave you something and you gave it back to them, they'd never give you anything again. But you're wrong because I am God. I cannot stop giving you life-affirming opportunities, commitments, relationships, and dreams. And you say no to me for the same reasons you said no when you were pregnant. And I didn't know I was saying no. So from then on, I realized that God was not going to hold my abortions against me. He wasn't going to withhold anything from me because of that. And He really meant, as far as the East is from the West, He really meant it. And I just needed to accept it. I know God has the purpose with my journey because, like I said before, we're all hurting somehow, and uh, if I can be of help, I don't want to be just sitting in the pews anymore. I want to be active, being Jesus' hands, Jesus' feet, comforting people and helping them to heal. Try to rest in the fact that He is involved in your life and He will get you through it. Maybe not in the way that you're hoping, but He's there for you and He knows your heart. And if you allow him to, he'll take your life and make it. Something wonderful. The arugula has bavery taste. <laughs> Okay, the only thing I can do, like Julia, is be The more I have courage to admit my journey, the more people have been coming to me and saying, oh, I, this is how I've been feeling. <laughs> how do you feel? Sure. How do you feel? <laughs> I, I am. I'm nothing if I'm not humble. <laughs> what did he? What was my verse? He turned my mourning into laughter. Okay, thank you, God. 